Hey guys, welcome to today's episode and I'm so excited. He's been on our show before and so has his beautiful wife, Mama Z. But today we have Dr. Z. He's on, he's got a new book out, Essential Oils Apothecary coming out really soon. He's got naturallivingfamily.com, which is an amazing site that has so much information on there for how your family can live a really natural, healthy life. And today we have an exciting topic for you. We're talking about how to get rid of chronic fatigue and increase your sex drive. So today's going to be fun. So welcome, Dr. Z. Well, Chantel, thank you for having me. This is going to be a good one. (laughs) So I'm really excited about your new book coming out, but I want to really focus on chronic fatigue for just a second. So give me some of the signs that you know, because some people are just like, I I have chronic fatigue, but they really may not have it. They're just tired a lot. So what is some of the signs that you go, no, you have chronic fatigue syndrome and what can they do about it? You know, this is, that's, this is a hard question to answer. And, and so when I was researching for this book and this book is all about chronic conditions and diseases, I mean, we're going to advanced strategies and protocols. And so I found a natural pairing of things. And I'm answering your question, by the way, just a roundabout way. Trust me, trust the journey. So when I'm going through the book, I talk about stress and anxiety because they're very similar, a lot of overlap. I talk about depression and substance abuse in one chapter because they're very similar, a lot of overlap in treatment. When it comes to chronic fatigue, I found out there's a significant overlap with fibromyalgia. Why? Is because most people, many people are misdiagnosed. And people that come up with literally the same exact symptoms of fibromyalgia, they get diagnosed with chronic fatigue. And some people go to a different doctor down the road with the same exact symptoms and they get diagnosed with fibromyalgia, but they actually have chronic fatigue. And it's like, well, what is it? Is it the chicken or the egg? And so that's the concern that I have. And here's the problem with all of this is regardless of what you're diagnosed with, fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue, most of the time you're getting a painkiller, an antidepressant, and maybe something like a sleep aid. That's basically the big picture here. And so how do you define it? How do you diagnose it? And the thing is, and this is what's hard for people to really appreciate is that these are, these are man-made diagnoses. Like you, there is no blood work to prove that you have um, chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. Like there is no tumor that's visible under an MRI. So when you're looking at diseases like diabetes or hypertension, we measure glucose, we measure the blood pressure in the, the, you know, the arterial walls to determine, hey, this is within normal limits, this isn't. But when someone has chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, they just have a slew of symptoms and then they call it something. And by the way, the diagnosis and the diagnoses requirements have changed. The diagnostic criteria for fibromyalgia has changed so many different times. The same thing, chronic fatigue. Essentially, you just don't feel well. You, you have general malaise, general lethargy, um, sporadic pain. You don't sleep very good. You don't wake up refreshed. Um, your, your libido is trash. That's why we want to talk a little bit about sex, which is a wonderful topic to encompass this whole chronic disease discussion. And so basically, you just don't know what's wrong, but you know something's wrong. And I want to relate because I'm, I used to deal with this. And you go to a point where you just bang your head against the wall because, yeah, drinking a cup of coffee or having a shot of espresso will get you through maybe a low moment, you know, taking some extra melatonin or a sleep aid will maybe give you that better or maybe that extra glass of wine. A lot of people do will help you maybe fall asleep quicker. Maybe that Advil or aspirin will, will help you so you don't have those aches and pains all day. But it's this weird rut. And ultimately, what I want to point out here is this is a chronic condition that didn't just happen. And under the scope of chronic disease and conditions, and I I, I cover this as well as I possibly can in the introduction of my book, is that these things, these issues, including cancer, including obesity, including, you know, Alzheimer's, they start in childhood. And it takes years to develop a chronic condition and a disease, including fibromyalgia, including 
chronic fatigue, including erectile dysfunction and low libido. And so from years of chronic inflammation, years of stress and anxiety on the body, the body essentially just starts to break down. It doesn't function. And then you add on a horrible, you know, the horrible standard American diet, potential abuse of, of, of prescription drugs, and just mismanaging our life, getting out of nature, being stuck in this cardboard box or this wooden box all day long, every day, people find themselves like, almost like one day you're just like, you know, I haven't been feeling well for a while. It's usually not, you don't wake up the, tomorrow with, oh, I'm tired. It's like, eh, I don't really feel that good, but let me have a shot of espresso. And then the next day, two shots. And then next thing you know, you need these triple half calf five. Like I, I'll never forget. I used to go to Starbucks. My daughter, you know, Esther, I mean, she was a baby. She actually thought I worked at Starbucks because I, when I was getting my doctorate, I used to go to Starbucks to study. It was like one of the only places I could go. And I didn't have an office, couldn't afford it. And mommy would say, yeah, daddy's doing his work at Starbucks. So my, he, she thought I was a barista. But anyway, I'll, I'll never forget. <laughs> I'll never, because I, no joke, I used to like, by the way, I, I would have rented a chair for like, 10, 20 bucks an hour if I had to. I was there for hours. I'll never forget being in line. And this guy ordered this whatever, like whatever it was. I just remember him saying three extra shots of espresso and six pumps of like this ungodly sugar thing that they put in it. I started thinking to myself, like, like, where did that become normal? Like where the normal cup of coffee doesn't give you that high, the jolt, you need three extra shots extra and six extra pumps of this high fructose corn syrup trash just to give you that jolt to get through that day. That's when you know your body's broken down. But again, it starts with like, oh, I don't really feel that good. I want a cup of coffee, maybe pick up and go and then, oh, I need a cup of coffee at noon. And then I need a cup of coffee at seven, like at night. That's a sign that, that the wear and tear so anyway, long answer to a short question, but I want to encompass this holistic approach to how we're managing chronic disease and conditions, because ultimately, here's the thing. If you're finding yourself tired a lot, that's a sign of worse things to come in the future. That's why I covered that chapter before I even talk about heart disease and cancer, which are in the other chapters later in the book. But these are like these nagging symptoms, low libido, erectile dysfunction, you know, aches and pains and fatigue and fibro, these are like the precursors to those life-threatening diseases that are the top causes of death worldwide. I think for me, when I think of fibromyalgia, I always think that fiber, like if I had to think about the differences of someone's like, what's the difference? I think I would probably say that fibromyalgia, both of them are massive, massive fatigue, but that fibromyalgia adds a little bit of muscle pain and that, that it adds more of that muscle pain and muscle disorders with the, you know, chronic fatigue. And then the chronic fatigue syndrome is just, you know, more of an overwhelming lack of energy. Is that kind of how you look at it? No, no, not, not mm -hmm. really. That's the confusing mm -hmm. thing because mm -hmm. people that d battle with clinical chronic fatigue, part one of the, sim the litany of symptoms is pain. Mm. Sporadic. Yeah. Here's the thing though, sporadic unexplained pain, which is exactly what fibro is. Mm -hmm. So whether you start with the pain or start with the fatigue. So basically pain and fatigue are inseparable. And there's a million reasons why it's basically isolated chronic inflammation. And it's like, well, this is really interesting. So yeah, that's where, again, Chantel, when I was doing the research for the book, quite frankly, I didn't know this. And this was one of my little aha moments. And that's why when I was looking at it deeper, there's also a viral component, which is why here's the thing. This is why we need to talk about this now, you know, post 2020 pandemic, now 2021, God knows when this thing's going to finally wane out. Right. By the time of airing, I'm um, recording this. We're still in the middle of this pandemic. The Epstein Barr virus is known as a primary um, precursor. Getting a viral infection is a primary precursor to both chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. So we're starting to see more people. And I'm predicting because of the viral infection due to coronavirus 
um, you know, COVID-19, we're going to be seeing more cases. And we already have. We already have seen a slew of cases when it comes to mental health issues. But we're going to see more and more when it comes to chronic fatigue and fibro. But yeah, this is really confusing. Like, this is not easy. This is not a, hey, you have a tumor or no, it's like a benign whatever. Like it's, it, this isn't malignant or benign kind of situation. Like this isn't clear cut. And that's why so many people with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia uh, are, are chronically unwell. And they just go from doctor to doctor, misdiagnosed to diagnose. But again, painkillers, sleep aids, and antidepressive um, agents are the top three prescriptions for both conditions. And I would argue that they're interchangeable because so many people treat them interchangeably. Hey guys, I'd love for you guys to listen to a podcast that we did about the side effects from wine and the differences between natural wine and traditional wine. So go to ChantelRayway.com slash wine and you'll see transcripts, you'll see some different episodes, but here's the thing. You can get your penny bottle now of dry farm wines and make the decision that if you're going to have wine to make sure you have the most natural, healthy wine in the world with no added additives, only natural ingredients. All the other wines out there have so much sulfate, so much sugar. Why put that poison in your body? So get your penny bottle now at ChantelRayWay.com slash wine. So surprisingly, me or my family, we have not gotten the coronavirus. Like, I don't know how, because we've done so much traveling. We've gone everywhere. We haven't stopped our life in one area, like not one bit, like uh, we haven't changed at all. We were still running the same pace. I mean, we kind of just are doing whatever. I, I don't wear a mask unless someone forces me to, but somehow we have not gotten Corona. No one in my family has. But one thing that I noticed on, I just got some lab work done. And one thing that it said over and over on my lab work, I've taken it over and over, and it said that I have had the Epstein-Barr virus, like I don't have it currently. And it's so weird because on the last, let's say over the last year and a half, all it says is you have the antibodies for the Epstein-Barr virus, but you, but I don't currently have it. And that's what it just says. But it's been, it shows up yep. for the last really two years or more on my my blood work that says I've rec somehow rec had it, didn't know it, recovered from it. You know, I don't even remember a time that I've, I had it, but that I, I've recovered from it. And Epstein-Barr virus is another one that is like massive fatigue, ma you know, low energy, everything like that. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about sex for a minute and, you know, go over in your book, give us a little tasting of a couple of tips that you give on what to do. Oh, well, before we do that, since we were talking about chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, what are some solutions that you give in your book that can help with that? And then we'll jump to the sex. Yeah. You know, I'm going to pull up some things. Actually, I'm going to go pull up my book in front of me here. Um, so... To your point about Epstein-Barr, and I want to reemphasize this for people who have had mono as a teenager, potentially, you know, um, a lot of folks experience chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia type of symptoms and or after a flu infection or virus. And so right now, experts are theorizing and the, the leading theory is that chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia is a combination of viral infections, allergies, hormonal factors, right? Again, we, we I know you've had a lot of guests lately on hormone balance. This is key and psychological factors all affecting the immune system. It's basically your body. It's almost like a pre autoimmune state. It's like your body is just shutting down. All right. So when you look at that, how do we approach that? Well, first, from a symptom-based standpoint, um, people need to have these, again, this is my answer to the question. We got to treat the symptoms. So again, the people to be diagnosed with chronic fatigue today, you have to have eight of the following symptoms for at least six months. So you go to the doctor, say, hey, here are my symptoms. They've lasted six plus months. You'll be diagnosed with chronic fatigue. Mild fever and chills, sore throat, painful lymph nodes, unexplained general body weakness, muscle discomfort or pain, 
unusual headaches, difficulty speaking, um, difficulty sleeping, aches and pains that travel from joint to joint. Again, this is why there's so much confusion with fibro. Again, we're, we're talking about chronic fatigue specifically. Fatigue for 24 hours or more after exercise. So when you exercise, you're just done for days. And complaints of what people also call fibro fog. Again, we're talking about chronic fatigue, forgetfulness, irritability, confusion, difficulty, thinking, depression. So these are the symptoms of chronic fatigue, which sound pretty much identical to the symptoms of fibromyalgia, which they are. So what do you do? How do you use essential oils? I would use, first of all, you're not going to cure chronic fatigue overnight. You're not going to cure fibromyalgia overnight. These are chronic conditions that took years to develop. It's going to take a little bit of time to really resolve. And I would refer back to your guest, your work, your book on fasting is so important when it comes to these conditions, proper nutrition, getting in more of a positive mood. And I know you do a lot with empowerment. Like there's a lot of mental health aspects of it. What I could do and I talk about in my book, how to knock out these symptoms. Like let's say it's sleep and giving someone a good night's sleep might just be the little thing that they need to help them wake up more refreshed, less irritable and ready to have a more productive, healthy blessed day. And so that's where I would refer people to the sleep solutions that we offer in the book. Like for example, our favorite sleep remedy is a mixture of lavender, Roman chamomile and vetiver essential oils. Well, what if you don't have vetiver? No problem. What if you don't have Roman chamomile? No problem. Just use lavender, use whatever you got, but using these essential oils and putting them in your, your water diffuser at night, just push the on button and let the vapor in the mist just really permeate through your, your, your room, get into your limbic system, which is your, your, your part of your brain that controls your memory, your mood, your emotions, and your autonomic function. These help put you in the parasympathetic state immediately. Again, that rest and digest state. Elang Lang, it's another wonderful essential oil to help reduce anxiety produce calm and get you in that parasympathetic state, which by the way, hold on, I have to stop you right now because your wife on the podcast, who, if you haven't listened to her episode (laughs) a couple of of weeks ago, she talks about you and I'll probably get in trouble by her telling you this, but she was like telling us the story about Ylang Lang and the volleyball. And she's like, (laughs) (laughs) Ylang Lang, my boy, I love Hey, that's why Elang Lang's in my my uh, libido boosting erectile dysfunction blend. You know, here's the thing. Elang Lang is a floral scent. It's wonderful. It's been proven, literally proven to help reduce the anxiety related to having stress, like sex. Like why are people anxious about sex? Well, a million reasons why people can be anxious about having sex. So yeah, I, I didn't want to use a Lang Lang. Like that's a florally kind of smell. And I was like, Sabrina, I can't wear this stuff. My, my guy friends are going to take away my guy card when I go play beach volleyball with them. Like I had to get over the stigma. That's basically the joke at the house. I had to get over the stigma of, of smelling pretty. And you know what? Um, maybe I'm more in tune with my feminine side than other guys. I don't know. I don't have to smell like musk. It's cool, but I've really embraced all the essential oils, but yeah, having a Lang Lang, Clary Sage, Drania, more quote unquote, typical women's health oils. They are wonderful at putting a woman in that parasympathetic rest and digest calming state, but they're also good for pain. I mean, just again, so many different ways that these oils actually help your body balance hormones, especially estrogen. And that's why they're important because your body, when it's out of whack, when it's in this this state of chronic fatigue, this chronic inflammation, fibromyalgia, low libido, you'll see they're all connected. So I just talked about sleep. What do you do for headaches? I mean, a million things, but pain, um, several essential oils I want people to really consider. Um, In my book, I have a joint and uh, bone disorder chapter, and we go right into the best oils for arthritis. And essential oils like frankincense come into play. Copaiba, which is an essential oil that's made from the resin of the copaiba tree. It acts very similar like CBD does on the CB2 receptors of the endocannabinoid system which is pretty profound because if if you have hesitancy or you don't want CBD or you're concerned about it in any which way, well, you can ingest or use copaiba topically, or my opinion, use it with CBD to get even a better approach, which helps with pain, which helps with sleep, inflammation. CBD helps with a million things. Copaiba does the same thing. Um, Orange oil, 
wonderfully anti-inflammatory, helps with pain. Peppermint, that's our go-to, great for headaches. You could, again, get a drop of peppermint with some coconut oil in your hand, give yourself a little neck rub, put on your mastoid bone, that that you know bone in the base of your, your skull. A million different things that you could do with essential oils for symptom-based management. And that's why I want to encourage people. Again, we're talking about chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia here. Oils can help with your symptoms. And whether it's boosting your your energy by inhaling or making my little, I have it here, my my matcha green tea latte with um, some spearmint in it with cinnamon bark, like that's a great natural way of boosting energy. You don't get that crash that a lot of people get with, um, you know, acidic coffee. Um, Adding oils to your food, to your diffusers, to your body care really hence helps enhance your life, but you'll start to notice easing a lot of those symptoms. Um, and I guess overall, I want to encourage people with this truthfully, that that you follow the advice that you're getting from Chantel and her other guests on the other aspects of life, like food, exercise, mind, body, all that stuff, supplements. You start to heal internally, like at the root cause of what's happening here. And you'll notice, you'll start to feel better slowly. Like you'll notice you don't need that second or third cup of coffee in the day. Like that's your sign, like you're getting better. And you don't even realize it though. And that's the hard thing. You didn't realize that you were getting chronic fatigue. You didn't realize when you started developing fibro until it got to the point where you just couldn't handle it anymore. And that's when the pain got so bad, when the fatigue got so bad, when you're just yuck, so bad you went to the doctor but there were months of that years that were kind of subtle little chronic low grade eh, i'll deal with it i'll man up a woman up i'm a mom i'm a caretaker i don't want to go to the doctor i don't have time i'll try this so i want you to be really cognizant of the subtle increase of maybe one way of saying subtle increase of feeling better, but the decrease of the symptoms. And you're you're just improving slightly. And next thing you know, it's like, wow, I feel really good. Hey guys, I really want you to join our intermittent fasting and OMAD Facebook group. We're doing tons of giveaways right now for posting your before and after pictures. And just for posting a question in there, we're giving away free protein shakes, some digest aid, all kinds of fun stuff. So please join our intermittent fasting and OMAD Facebook group. The link is in the show notes. So one thing that I think is is strange, because I remember reading something and I was reading something about, you know, all the different essential oils that increase your sex life. And all of the ones seem to be very like female like rose yeah. and jasmine. And like you said, ylang lang. And it just seemed like they're very like, like you said, like if you're a guy and you're like, okay, I'm not putting rose essential oil on. Um, I'm going to, you know, I'm, they're going to take away my man card if I do that. <laughs> so two yeah. questions for men in particular, yeah. what would you do? And two, you know, is it enough? Cause obviously, you know, essential oils can be used through def- diffusion or through sprays or topical application. So what would you say, like, is it enough to just have an an essential oil diffuser at your desk or, you know, if you're working all day to really be able to capture all of the benefits of it? Or does it really need to be topical? Yeah, yeah, there's three different approaches that we talk about. There's inhalation through the diffuser or your inhaler, topical through your body care, ointments and salves, and ingesting through, I mentioned like my matcha latte, the culinary approach, or also straight up like pill approach where you put it in a gel capsule and you take it like you would a medicine. All three work, all three have a function, all three, in my opinion, depending on the severity of the condition, should be used. And that's why you really... Our, our work, we cover all of that. You know, the book covers strategies on every which way. Um, by and large, though, you could do most of what you need through topical application and inhalation. Because again, when you apply essential oils topically the right way, the compounds in the oils penetrate into your bloodstream within minutes. I mean, and that's been proven. 
So that's something to think about. Like if you want a systemic approach to essential oils, inhaling them will work. You'll get a minor amount in your respiratory system. But if you really want the essential oil chemicals to get through your whole body, topical is key. Um, ingesting is the most uh, profound and the most therapeutic dose. And, you know, not like I would have someone take like, like a libido pill like they would for um, Viagra, but for some severe situations, they might want to consider that. And, and so to your point though about guys, you know, the thing that we need to realize about sex and about libido is your libido really by and large is, is the primary and dare I say, one of the first indicators of how healthy you are. And I want us to remember, because I've never heard anyone discuss this ever in this context. Um, I want people to remember being a teenager you know, before we started getting sick, right? Before you started really abusing yourselves, or maybe you didn't, maybe you were raised on good, clean eating. Maybe you weren't like me, but imagine before a lot of the fast food and maybe some alcohol and cigarettes or too many prescription drugs, like you're healthy, you're young and boom, women, they started their menses, guys, they started to developing the hormone surge with testosterone. And next thing you know, you just want to have sex, like that was a big thing as a teenager, like the quote unquote horny teenager syndrome. Like there's a reason why, because these are arguably some of the healthiest people on the planet. They're young. They had their bodies haven't been abused. They haven't been exposed to toxins in the air and the body care for 50, 60, 70 years. These are young, robust, hopefully mostly healthy young adults. And one of the out, one of the things that they are struggling to control is this urge to procreate. Why it was a God given urge to procreate and, and to sustain our society. Like libido, sex is is really for. It's like that's what we need to continue the human species, and that's why it's so enjoyable. That's why food is so enjoyable. That's why so many other things like aroma are so enjoyable. God gave us these senses to enjoy for our betterment, but also for the procreation and the, and the fulfillment of our calling to be fruitful and multiply. The first thing you told Adam and Eve, hey, have sex, enjoy. And they did, and they enjoyed. And so when you don't enjoy that, when you don't feel like you want to, think about it. If people just stopped having sex because they didn't weren't in the mood, like big picture, it's extreme, it's never gonna happen. But everyone on the planet right now, everyone has chronic fatigue, everyone has fibromyalgia, everyone's just out of the mood. No one wants to have sex anymore, so no one does. What's gonna happen in a generation? We become extinct. So think from an evolutionary standpoint, think from a, a biblical standpoint, how important it is for us to continue our lovemaking and sex experience just for, again, the procreation of our society and people. And, and you'll notice though, it's usually I'm not in the mood. Why? I'm stressed. I, I, I don't feel good. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I, I'm, I'm achy. I have pain. It's like the last thing in the world you want to do is actually get involved in some sort of potential cardiovascular activity and have sex with someone when you're not feeling well. And that's typically the first thing that most people give up because it's also expendable. It, most people think it's expendable. Like, well, I have to, I have to put on my pajamas or I got to get my kids ready for school. I got to go to work. I don't really need to have sex. So it's one of those things where it's like, uh, uh. but I want to encourage people though, with this thought is that as you become healthier overall, as you start to really mitigate and, and manage these symptoms, these chronic symptoms like sleep, fatigue, these things like anxiety, depression, pain, you're going to want to have sex. It's like your body just, wow, it's, it's, it's a release. And that's the other thing. It's a release for a robust health profile. And this is a litmus test for everybody. Everybody, if you do not have a desire for sex multiple times a week, and I'm not saying you have to have sex, but if you don't have a desire for sex, if not daily, multiple times a week, that's a sign that there is damage to the body. You're definitely dealing with chronic inflammation and that you're well on your way to chronic disease. And, and, and it's something where I want people to recognize that low libido and erectile dysfunction are the precursor to chronic disease because it's one of the first things that happen when your body starts to break down. So when talking about guys, yeah, maybe guys don't want to 
put on something that smells floral. Um, I get it, but you know, it's the answer to that question is something I, I learned in endocrinology class in school is that for men, out of all the different aromas that stimulate libido, it's the pumpkin pie smite, pumpkin pie spice smells. Like the best way to a man's, you know, heart is through his stomach. Well, same thing through lovemaking is that pumpkin pie, the cinnamon, the clove, the nutmeg, those, those, those spices that make up pumpkin pie. So what you could, that's why I include um, cinnamon bark in our libido boosting blend because it has a nice spicy kind of aroma. But maybe incorporating some of those oils in a diffuser can help. But here's the thing, and this is something that I cover a lot as well in the book, is the mental health aspect. Because for guys especially, um, to, to get an erection, that is a product of the parasympathetic nervous system. All right. So I'll never forget again, same class point and shoot, right? Point and shoot men, you point erection, parasympathetic shoot, ejaculate sympathetic, right? So to, to get an erection, a man has to be in the parasympathetic state and to ejaculate, you need to be in the sympathetic state. And then you're back in the parasympathetic state because you just exhausted yourself. That's where I want women to think about if their spouses or partners are struggling in the bedroom. That's why, guys, if you're listening, if you are struggling with ED, erectile dysfunction, that is a surefire sign that you are really losing the battle of chronic stress and anxiety and other mental health concerns. So what do you do? You got to relax. And what does that mean? Well, Maybe you don't need those floral oils. If it bothers you, if lavender bothers you, well, get some cedar wood, sandalwood, get some pine essential oils, anything in the world that's going to get you to chill out and relax, really anything in the world. But to your point, there is a reason why even the Bible talks about the rose of Sharon and the beautiful fragrances of myrrh and aloes and all these things. But kind of go back though, like the Bible, let's talk about the spices and the aloes, like spicing up, putting these, these aromas in the bed sheets. So there is an element of that spicier, because again, they've known from the beginning of time, what makes men going and women going, but yeah, rose and elang lang and lavender, uh, these oils, jasmine, very floral, very pretty, um, maybe something in the air. But here's the thing, though, too. When you're diffusing something in the air, you're not going to really recognize the smell after a few minutes. I mean, yeah. your body adapts to it. So like me, I have I have wonderful um, orange oil being diffused. I walked in the room. I smelt it. I enjoyed it. 20, 30 minutes into this interview, however long it's been, I don't, I don't smell it anymore. My body's adapted, which is fine. Just like how your body adapts to clothing. Like if you feel your clothing right now, you're going to go crazy. I mean, your body, oh, I put on my shirt. I feel it. I don't feel clothes anymore. It'll drive you nuts if you feel your clothes all day long. So just think about that. Like setting the mood is important because you need to put your body into a body state where it could relax and just be. Hey guys, I'm so excited. My new book, One Meal and a Tasting, is out now. And if you order the book on Amazon, just the regular paperback edition, if you go in and make a review, you will get the audio book for free. Send a copy of your receipt to questions at chantelrayway.com and you'll get the audio book right away. Well, we know these essential oils work for your libido because Dr. Z and Mama Z have five kids and I just <laughs> talked with Mama Z and she was just telling me about how perfect your new son is and she oh. already wants another. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and well, we, and, and honestly, we, yes. the number one thing a man needs in all the marriage books that you read is sex. They say, you know, that is a number one thing. But I will say that, you know, I want to expand on what you said about relaxation, because what I'm seeing that I, I'm just seeing so many people right now abuse alcohol and, yes. you know, contemporary advice says you should utilize alcohol to just relax. And what do you think? Because I think that sometimes alcohol can have the opposite effect and ruin your efforts towards your increasing your libido if you're abusing it, because it's just, it, it helps if you have a little bit, but people are just abusing it to the point that, Hey, this can cause more problems than you think. Can you expand on that? Yeah. I was actually taught in nutrition 
and we ended up, I forget the hours. It was, um, we, I ended up having close to a thousand hours of nutrition training when I was getting my chiropractic degree. And that's a lot, by the way. Um, that's a lot of nutrition training. And I will never, I will never forget our instructor teaching us that alcohol, like at a biochemistry level is an anti-nutrient. It adds nothing to the body, but only sucks out the nutrients because the body needs to metabolize it. And so alcohol as a whole should be looked at as a luxury, as something that we don't need. And when it comes to alcohol as a, I mean, generally speaking, like I'll never ever have booze, like actually like alcohol, whiskey, whatever, beer, just nothing but empty carbohydrates with no value. Someone can argue, and I do like a glass of wine periodically with meals, you know, cultures around the world, Italian, Israel, all around the world, people will have a glass of wine. Um, there's benefits to that with the resveratrol and the antioxidants, but that's where it's like, okay, one glass of wine or one bottle of wine. And so that's why I want to encourage people. I mean, really, I don't see any, and I know people like, I like my margaritas or I like my Jack and Cokes. Well, you shouldn't be drinking Coke anyway, but I know a lot of people dive into the booze. Like there it's poison. Like there's nothing, especially think of it too, the grains that they extract them from. They're not organic non-GMO. Like this is the worst of the worst. You're not getting organic non-GMO um, hops and barley to make your beer. I mean, it's bad stuff. Um, filled with chemicals. And so anyway, if you can eat some good organic or good biodynamic wine, but the reality is though, you mentioned substance abuse, essentially alcohol abuse, you know, having too much alcohol will, will start to break down your body on every level, on every level. It doesn't help you at all. It creates chronic inflammation and it's a lot, it's a burden for the body. It's an anti, I want you to remember that phrase, anti-nutrient. So if you're tempted to have, again, I haven't had, and I used to be an alcoholic, so I could speak from experience. Um, I have not had a drink in almost 18, no, no, almost 19 years at the time that, that this is going to air. And so I've been at a beer in 19 years. Um, and it took me several years to be completely alcohol free till I would be even willing to have a half a glass or a sip of good wine. And so I'm very careful, very responsible when it comes to that. But from a health standpoint, you know, I would just caution people because it doesn't do you favors and you think it does. And here's the thing that people like about alcohol is that you lose your inhibitions and then you'll, you know, people then might want to do sexual things that they normally wouldn't want to do, whatever. Um, I wouldn't want to have to have you be relying on an alcohol to want to even make love to begin with. Like that's a, that's a bad sign. And so that's also a habit you don't want to get into. So anyway, um, I'll leave you to make that decision for yourself. But I would ask you to prayerfully consider, really straight up, prayerfully consider if this is something that you need to incorporate. But ultimately, is everything that we do life-giving or is it death-producing? That's really, this is a black and white world. I mean, I want people to think black and white. I mean, this drug is either going to do this or it's not. This supplement is going to do this or it's not. Eating this way is going to produce inflammation or it's going to help soothe inflammation. This is going to help boost my libido or it's not. And once you start making more black and white decisions with your health, there's no gray, there's no cheating. Um, we don't cheat. And you know how we live, Chantal. We've spent time together. I'm the same way. I drink four times a year and that's if I'm lucky. Um, I don't, I don't like how I feel. Even for me to have half of a drink, I go so hard, so much that I want to be at the top of my game every single day. And people give me a hard time all the time because I do go out a lot and I'm with a lot of friends and a lot of them drink and they're like, oh, just have one drink. And they, they almost think like they've hit the jackpot. So about four times a year, I kind of give in my husband's birthday. He loves when I drink, um, you know, so they, there's a joke because my name when I was first born was Angela Panahinia. That's for another story, but oh, wow. <laughs> that's when I was born. That was my name. And so they always joke like the four times a year that I do drink, they're like, oh yeah, Angela comes out when Chantal drinks. But honestly, even, even those four times that I drink, if I have two drinks, that's the max. And that's because I just, I don't like the way I feel. I'm so used to not drinking that I don't even like how I am. I just, I feel like I'm just as much fun 
when I don't yeah. drink. So, yeah. and and you don't need it to have, enjoy time between the sheets. I mean, the reality is if you're with someone that you love and if you're in a good place spiritually first, right? Your your relationship, it's consecrated to God. And, you know, it, we, we, we relate as Christian Chantal and people that aren't Christians, they could relate on being spiritually united with their partner, right? As a Christian, my wife and I are united in one. Um, we have a prayerful experience together. We love each other. We want to be with each other. It's like sex is a celebration. It's a, it's a celebration of your union, your commitment to this individual for the rest of your life. Like ideally, this individual is the only person you've ever made love with. And that's really the goal. That's, that's the purpose of sex, not to scatter your seed men all over the place or ladies. Like, you know, again, that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day, but it's a celebration. And the, and what do you do when you celebrate your, your heart is overflowing. You're, you're full of gratitude and love. And why am I talking about this with essential oils? Cause essential oils help that. Like when you inhale essential oils, when those chemicals get into your bloodstream, like those volatile organic compounds, when they penetrate in your bloodstream, they produce a physiological response. Like your brain starts to secrete neurotransmitters and hormones. You feel better. You're happier. You're calmer. You're more at peace. You're off guard. But if, if, if you know, ultimately sex starts with a conversation and, and a conversation that you're enjoying, like you can't go from arguing with someone to an enjoying, you know, a session in bed. I mean, it just doesn't work like that. You could force it. You could drink your way through it like a lot of people do. But the reality is love is called lovemaking for a reason. And that's why I like that. And that's what really separates us from the animals and the primates. And so, again, find what works for you and, and enjoy. I want to encourage people. I, I actually had an interview um, with a sex expert and she talked, well, what about, you know, other things when it comes to sex or essential oils edible? Read between the lines. Yes, yeah, so we actually use essential oils as, um, as a base for a lubricant. Um, they're great. Just highly dilute them. Again, follow the recipes in the book. And the, the key rule of thumb is you want to go to a 1% dilution or less. What's that mean? Six drops of essential oil in a one ounce carrier. So that's like 600 drops in a carrier oil, like coconut oil, six, you know, six drops, only six of 600 is 1%, right? That's the math. But we're talking highly diluted essential oils. That's safe as a lubricant. I'd rather you use that. And that's something that we use for Sabrina's perineum massage when we got her ready for home birth. Because, you know, we, we stretched the perineum so she wouldn't tear. She never tore out of all five babies. That's partly why. So that's something to consider when it comes to um, the lubrication aspect. Yes, safe for the vagina, safe for the penis. Um, the blends that we recommend are again, safe you know, internally. So, you know, if oral sex is something that you engage in, you don't have to worry about that. Um, it's just an all encompassing experience, but it, maybe ladies, if your husband deals with ED, consider a foot rub, a back rub, like getting him in that mood. Guys, same thing with your wife. Like, you know, my wife is, you know, she, she's the primary caretaker of our five kids. She's all over the place managing this wonderful household. She spends time with helping with the recipes and the formulations of our books. So she's, you know, a part-time working mom doing a lot of stuff. Like she needs a foot rub. She needs a back rub. She needs to be pampered a little bit. And if you have a little money, maybe some extra money, Maybe those roses are giving her a massage or paying for her to get a massage or something, get her nails done. Like what is her love language and how do you fill up his love tank, right? His or her, what is the language that they need? And, and maybe ladies that's sitting down watching that stupid football game. You don't want to sit and watch because that his love language is quality time. And so you grin and bear it mess on your phone for a little bit while he watches the Packers lose or something. And you enjoy a, a time together because you just met his, you know, emotional need. So yes, essential oils can help play a piece of it. And I want to leave you with that. I want to leave you with just, just enjoy the experience and find what works for you and your lover, because it's a wonderful journey. And then why are we talking about this with chronic fatigue? Because, you know, you're not going to want to have sex if you're fatigued or in pain all the time. So you want to think about that, right? You want to think about, are you battling depression, anxiety, stress, fatigue, pain? Well, how do we approach all these things holistically one by one by one? Next thing you know, you feel good. You're not achy. You want to get busy. 
And it's like, wow, this is fun. I enjoy being young again. So I know I have one last final questions and then I'll let you go. So I've been reading some articles and everyone's probably heard that too much alcohol or excessive amount of certain medications can damage your liver. And obviously your liver helps to extract the nutrients it needs from your food and eliminate all the toxins and substances from your blood. Mm -hmm. But they're doing a lot of things now that are saying that people are putting too many herbal remedies and too many dietary supplements that can also harm the liver. And they're just, you know, I know for me, for a while, I was just out of control with supplements because it would be one guy would come on the show and be like, well, this is this supplement yep, and this yep. supplement. By the time you knew it, I was on 30 different supplements and I was like not feeling good. And so talk about how we can balance maybe taking less supplements or getting that from our food and not having and maybe uh, kind of getting the rest of our nutrients and, and some of that supplementation from essential oils instead of overdosing on, on all these supplements. Well, hey, that's a good point because the same thing with essential oils because there could be liver toxicity and kidney toxicity by overdoing it. That's mm -hmm. why we cover max oral dosing. And that's the concern. You mentioned something, Chantel, and you and I have many friends and colleagues that are in the functional medicine space. My number one complaint with many, not all, but some and many functional medicine practitioners are they prescribe supplements like a medical doctor prescribes drugs and then they leave it at that. Yeah, you need to be on this XYZ supplement the rest of your life. Well, what's the difference? Yeah, there might not be as many side effects. It might not be as toxic, but you're still trapped and dare I use the word enslaved to an outside approach for the rest of your life? Like why shouldn't the goal be to completely heal yourself? And I say that because we've abused supplements completely. And I, I'm glad you mentioned that because your body can only metabolize so much. And God didn't design our body to metabolize high doses of these, whatever it might be, a variety of nutrients or the protein. Of the, I have so many problems with protein powder. It's like there's just, it's enough's enough with a lot of this stuff. And it's a multi, multi hundred billion dollar company. So giving your body a break, you know, the one thing I did when I used to work with patients and clients is I got them off of all supplements. I'm like, stop. Just stop, give your body a break. Your body needs to learn how to metabolize food properly. Your body needs to be able to heal itself. And it, again, you're gonna potentially tax and stress your liver and your kidneys if you're over consuming supplementation. Because again, you're getting a certain amount of vitamin C in, a, in, a, in an orange. Like just think of it common sense wise. You're getting a certain amount of vitamin C in an orange, like that's a lot of, you know, but to get the same amount of vitamin C in a supplement by eating oranges, you'd have to eat like 10, 15 oranges. You're going to get sick. You'd vomit. You couldn't eat that many oranges. It'd be like you, enough's enough. So we're forcing our body and oftentimes our body can't properly metabolize. It's just too much. So I would encourage people to think about anything that you're taking. Like, first of all, I'm a huge fan of um, completely cutting out multivitamins unless you know for sure it's whole food plant-based and it's metabolized because most people don't metabolize their multis and it's just, especially the stuff you get at Kroger or Walmart, it's just junk. Um, but I encourage people to look at their supplements and like, okay, can I get this in my food? And let's point out vitamin D. That's something you really can't get in your food in high quantities. And if you're living in a Northern environment or a colder Northern hemisphere um, location, you might need to supplement with vitamin D just because of the virtue that you're not outside getting sunlight. But for me, I don't supplement with vitamin D most of the year when I live in Georgia, I'm outside. You can see in my tan, it's like, you know, I'm naturally getting my vitamin D, but in the cold winter months when we're inside, yes, I'm supplementing with vitamin D during those cold now COVID seasons where everyone's getting sicker on me. Yeah. I'll supplement with vitamin D a little bit because I know that I want to boost my immune system. But that's one of those things like I use supplements because I want to and to enhance my health. And if I do get sick or something is, I know what to approach. But the reality is you're not vitamin C supplement deficient. 
And that's something I think is important. You might be vitamin C deficient, but not vitamin C supplement deficient, Got which it. means how do you get it naturally in your foods? And that's simple nutrition that a lot of your experts I know speak about, but just simple things like how do I get these nutrients in my body? And maybe you get a blood panel and you find out that you have low vitamin B levels. Well, what are some good foods that have a decent amount of vitamin B? Start to like supplement your diet with more of those foods and you might find a natural balance. But the reality is, and this is the key, and this is what really got me, again, going back to my nutrition professor who taught about alcohol, the problem with, with treating, supp- the problem with treating vitamin and mineral deficiency with supplements is because an excess of vitamin C can actually cause a depletion of, let's say, vitamin K. It's because of the complex biochemical processes in the body. And again, God does not design our bodies to consume these pills all the time. And that's Mm -hmm. where I want to caution people with essential oils too, is I've experienced the same and people have experienced, it's rare, but you can overdo it with essential oils. But I think you can more overdo it with supplements, don't you? Oh, it's easier. Oh, it's easier. easier. Yeah. People aren't just, you know, ingesting essential oils takes a lot more time and energy and putting them in capsules and doing that, like it, it's not, yeah, it's not as widely accepted as all the million supplements out there. Um, but one thing to remember too is the cleanliness, the quality, and just like essential oils, the supplement market is is unregulated. So anyone can literally sell anything and put a label on it and say whatever they want to say on that label. And so always make sure that if you are taking a supplement, it's by a good manufacturer that's clean. But yeah, to your point, we take very, very few supplements in our home. Sabrina has had chronic um, gut issues since she's been like an infant. So there are certain things that she does. And then might be, you know, we're still believing God for complete healing. Um, But, you know, she used to be on 10 different prescription drugs, so she's been able to wean herself off that. So she likes high grade probiotics and she likes digestive enzymes and she does certain things that really helps her, but she's also still continuing to heal from something that really happened at birth that was just, that plagued her for 15, 20 years. Um, A healthy person, a healthy person shouldn't need supplements, right? And getting it from their food. I, I love that. And I think if you're low on something, look for the food that needs to have that. Well, this has been amazing. Tell listeners where they can find you, where they can follow you and where they can get your amazing new book coming out. Well, thanks again, Chantal, for having me. This was fun. Our website, like you mentioned earlier, naturallivingfamily.com, tons of great resources and and, and recipes for y'all. But the new book, The Essential Oils Apothecary, everywhere books are sold. And you could go to eoapothecary.com and get a special book bonus where if you buy the book, we got over um, 15 videos that we recorded how to make these recipes. We talk a lot like this. We have charts and guides to help you get the most out of the book, including a drug interaction chart that, by the way, isn't available anywhere else, anywhere. And it's something we want to help people because if we're going to be ingesting essential oils to treat fatty liver and Alzheimer's or chronic fatigue, we want to make sure there's no drug interactions with a pharmaceutical you might be taking. So get the book. Let's battle and beat chronic disease and conditions together and spice up things between the sheets just because (laughs) that was part of our conversation. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Well, this has been great. You guys stay tuned. We have another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now. 